I'm really happy that you could join us for what promises to be a, a fascinating discussion with uh, really an, educated, an education revolutionary, President Paul LeBlanc of Southern New Hampshire University. You'll hear more about him and from him uh, in just a moment. First, for those of uh, you who aren't familiar with them, our centers at Anderson act as hubs for leadership insights, faculty research, student and alumni engagement and service to our communities and to our society. The leadership discussion today is part of our Innovation Strategies for Success series, and it's one of a number of collaborations among our centers. We know that in today's world, there's an incredible, incredibly rapid pace of change, and that creates both opportunities and challenges and increasing demands on leaders. In fact, I've, I've said many times to, uh, and spoken many times to Terry about this, I don't think there's ever been a time where leadership has been more challenging. And uh, today we'll specifically be discussing the future of higher education and our guests' innovation in this key area are very important in many ways. From a business leadership standpoint, the is issues that we're going to discuss today are going to uh, really touch on some several themes that we've discussed numerous times here at Anderson in the last few years. The, uh, the, uh, the use of technology in a variety of domains, the role that businesses and businesses, business leaders play in society, and in this case, our roles in creating opportunity uh, and improving the lives of our students and our community. Today's conversation will be about innovative models in higher uh, education, and that's a really a great example of the kind of effort that we uh, are trying to make here at Anderson and at UCLA. So I hope you'll engage with us and learn from this and in the end, become better leaders serving your own organizations and the broader community and society. Uh, I'd now like to introduce my good friend and colleague, uh, Dean of the uh, UCLA School of Education and Information Studies, Christina Christie. Uh, she's uh, a, a wonderful partner in this uh, evening and in this discussion. We're very pleased she could join us. Tina, please. Thank you. So I understand we need to uh, project a little bit better. Uh, so I'm here to do that uh, as a New Yorker. So this is, uh, I could do it without the mic. So uh, thank you, Tony, uh, for inviting the School of Education and Information Studies to join you uh, here today with the Anderson School of Management in this important and exciting event. Um, welcome, President LeBlanc. We are thrilled to have you here at UCLA. Uh, I understand that you're a first-generation college student. How many of you here are also first-gen college students? Raise your hands. Okay, so... Uh, you understand, then, um, probably much that uh, President LeBlanc has explained in terms of the ways in which your life experience as a first-gen college student motivates you, particularly around issues of equity and access. And Paul has been a transformative figure in higher education. Uh, as president of Southern New Hampshire University, he's developed new models of education delivery systems that are democratizing education by expanding access to higher education to meet the needs of today's young adult and adult learners. I'm particularly struck by Paul's work in developing a hugely successful online education program while also carefully expanding his in-residence programs, always centering the needs of students. In the same way, He's promoted access and expanded educational and life opportunities for so many by spearheading the first fully competency-based degree program. That is incredibly remarkable. We have so much to admire and learn from Paul today. I again thank you for stopping in here at UCLA and please join me in welcoming the president of Southern New Hampshire University, Paul Lebel. And I'm Terry Kramer. Let me do a couple of quick intro remarks on uh, Paul, and it's great to see everybody here. So I heard Paul speak on a couple of different webinars over the last year and a half or so. And the first one I thought, wow, this is a really interesting webinar because it was all about education and how you use Zoom and online and other things, et cetera. And then I had a chance to meet him and I thought, geez, this conversation is going to be all about this intersection between technology and society. And what I realized, and I'm not going to steal his thunder, his story is a lot more than technology and society. It's much more expansive. So I thought, geez, he'd be great to speak at the school. 
And so my first call was to Tony. And I said, Tony, you know, this guy's going to talk about the future of higher education. I don't want to commit career suicide here by having somebody say that higher education needs to fundamentally change. And let me start with UCLA, et cetera. And Tony, true to his words, as he uh, said in the opening, the school is all about new models and thinking about its role as a public institution and fundamentally thinking about leadership and what we're doing with leadership. And then my next call was to Tina and I said, Tina, I don't wanna uh, piss you off early on. We're trying to form partnerships across <laughs> campus. <laughs> Talk about the future of education. And she said, this is her mission as well. And everything about thinking about access and how you kind of broaden impact. So I just wanna thank, first of all, Tony and Tina for being great role models about what UCLA is all about. So let me uh, say a couple things about Paul and, uh, and then we're gonna get into a, a, a discussion with him. As you know, he's the president of Southern New Hampshire University. And I have to admit, I didn't know a lot about Southern New Hampshire University when I listened to the webinar. And in like 30 seconds, I said, this is the school that I've heard about. Um, they are the largest uh, nonprofit provider of education <coughs> online in the nation. So 180,000 learners. Um, he was named one of the 15 classroom revolutionaries uh, in Fortune magazine and one of the most influential people in higher education. He's won a series of awards, including the TIAA Institute Hesburgh Award for Leadership Excellence in Higher Education. He has been an advisor in Washington to the Undersecretary Tid, Ted Mitchell, who is the Undersecretary of the Department of Education. He's already um, written more than one book. His first book was Student First, <laughs> Students First, Access, Equity, and Opportunity in Higher Education. That won the uh, Franson Award for Literature. Um, and then he's got a new book coming out in September, Broken, How Our Social Systems Are Failing Us and How We Can Fix Them. And that'll be out again in uh, September. Um, he is first generation um, in his family, extended family to go to college. He received his bachelor's degree at Framingham State University, his master's at Boston College, and his uh, PhD at the University of Massachusetts. Um, as I mentioned, when I first met him, he talks much more expansively than just education and technology, and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, I'll ask Paul a few questions to kind of start the conversation, and then we'll open it up to Slido uh, for any questions that you have. So you go to slido.com, S-L-I-D-O.com, and the event code is Easton, just like the Easton Center, E-A-S-T-O-N. You can either enter your own question or you can upvote an existing one, and I will endeavor to uh, pose the most popular questions. So, Paul, a big thank you for being here and, uh, and a welcome. My pleasure. After that beautiful eulogy, I should go off and die now. Yeah. <laughs> I apologize. I'm doing, you know, as you have been, two years of Zoom, so I dressed for business, waist up, and then I forgot and put jeans. And <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. Paul, I always like to start with somebody has done so many interesting things as a leader. To start with your story, you know, tell us what kind of informed your decisions and how you got into what you got into today. Yeah, so as you said, my family immigrated from what some people would call French Appalachia, uh, from a really hard scrabble farming village in New Brunswick. There were no jobs. People, would, the men, would go away for work. Women were left behind to take care of these sort of subsistence level farms. And like many immigrant stories, you know, somebody went to the U.S. and called back and said there are jobs. And we, we came down. I mean, we didn't even have a car. So we, you know, an uncle drove up and, and, we, and we came in. So I didn't speak English at first. My mother was a, a housekeeper. And uh, she would keep, she would uh, clean houses in these wealthy homes outside of Boston, the suburb of Weston. I learned to read by her plunking me down in the library. So these and it's still, it's a romantic sense for me of these beautiful wood panel libraries and the smell of leather and paper. And I would, you know, learn to read while she was vacuuming and cleaning those houses. Um, and we didn't know anybody. My parents had eighth grade education. We didn't know anybody. College. The kids of those families went to college. And it was really an incredible sixth grade teacher. So my mother who passed away a few years ago at age 96. She worked in a factory at the end of her life until she was 76. Um, but she remembers a parent-teacher conference where a teacher said, you know, Paul could go to college someday. And we didn't know anybody who went to college. Nobody in our neighborhood went to college. And she just held on to that. And uh, then it was a succession of teachers who, who sort of moved me on this journey. Um, and, and so I'm very small seat about the American dream <laughs> and the role of affordable, high-quality education. My loud voice is not usually an issue, but 
Yeah, it is. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll project further. So um, I'm very small too about it because it was possible. Um, but part of why I wrote this book, uh, this most recent book, is I feel like it's further out of reach of far too many students. I think we were shocked pre-pandemic when we saw the levels, for example, of food insecurity among college students across the country, 13% of them. When we look at the level of deb debilitating levels of debt, $1.7 trillion of debt today. When we look at a system that is failing too many people, 45% of students who start don't finish. We have almost 40 million Americans with some credits, debt, and no degree. It's the worst trifecta possible. Mm. Um, so for me, this feels like a system that I love, served me so well, but I do worry about what is the story of the immigrant kid to America today? Can he or she actually afford college and can it transform their lives as it transforms mine? And I think that's what drives me to sort of you say, no, it leads you to sort of your work. I'm really driven to restore a system I love and make possible what I continue to believe, which is education is still the greatest driver of social mobility and opportunity and by extension, social justice when it's equitable. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, dive deeper on this issue because when we talked, you talked about the customer or the student and you nicely kind of said, you know, Terry, your view is a, a kind of a narrow view of who the student is and you gave a more expansive view. Can you say a little bit more about it? Sure. Um, first of all, you can't say customer in higher ed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you go to your faculty and talk about customer service, they will, be, they will have, have a really wonderful goodbye party for you. <laughs> <laughs> but when we think about customer in terms of Clay Christensen's motion, and Clay was a dear friend, and some people know his work. He passed away not long ago at Harvard Business School was uh, on my board as well. We talk about jobs to be done. The people uh, invest their resources and their time and their money because there's a job that they want done. And when I look at the students we serve, um, on our campus, we serve students that probably have a lot of the same job that needs to be done here, which you came for an education that's going to open up career opportunities for you, a value-added network that you get at a wonderful place like UCLA. But for residential, traditional age students, it's also coming of age. It's I'm out from my parents. Uh, I'm figuring out who I am. I am developing my peer community. I am playing on a team. I'm developing my leadership skills and student organizations, et cetera. And I put that all under the bucket of coming of age. When I look at the majority of our students in our online, about 180,000 of them, typical student is a 29 year old, two kids working full time, stuck economically, needing a credential that 80% of them started and didn't finish. So 80% of our students come with credits, usually from more than one place. Often life got in the way. Economically, they had a kid. It could be any number of things. <coughs> they weren't ready. They just weren't good at school yet. Um, and they're coming back to get that credential. That's a very... So, you know, when I talked, I was talking to one of our students recently who's military. So two tours in Afghanistan, three kids, a dead-end job. He's working really hard to finish this degree. He's had all the coming of age he can handle. He knows what he's about. Right? He doesn't need that. It's a different job. It's not a better or worse job. It's a different job. And I think when, when I look at our, our work, we really always start with the question of student segmentation. Can we know a student's story? I'm going to go further than that. Can we know a student's multiple stories? Because I think one of the things Pyre does is we assign single stories to people, and there's danger in a single story. Can we know multiple stories? And then can we build an educational program or offering that works for that student? Um, so we do a lot of work in refugee populations, for example, in Africa and in the Middle East. Yet a different story. And for that one, it's escape. Mm -hmm. It's how do you get me a credential that gets me out of the camp? What's the average stay of a refugee now? Do you know? 21 years. Mm -hmm. Right? And we have a student who's coming over who was born in a Kakuma camp in Kenya. And, uh, was, uh, and has never lived anywhere else. Doesn't know what the life looks like. So our job there is very different, right? I mean, our job there is, let's talk about how to navigate a restroom, right? Basic. And these, they're every bit as smart as anyone in this room or on my campus. So the, the uh, talent is university distributed, but wow, the opportunity is so far removed. So every program starts with that question we built from that. Yep. And let me uh, uh, add on on the, the Clay Christensen piece. Do you consider yourself a disruptor? So disruptive innovation is serving unserved, I won't use the word customers, students, mm -hmm. et cetera. It's an unserved market, starting out kind of lower feature, not the same experience as with the, and then moving up market as time goes on. 
Yeah, so when we started our online program, we were probably disruptive, but online education is no longer disruptive. We know how to do it well. We know how what quality looks like. I think some of the things that we're doing around competency-based education is still quite disruptive. And if I can just sort of back up there and say, for me, sort of three buckets of innovation, and, and I will use Elbar from Clay. There's a sort of, uh, there's a bucket of, of innovation that is about doing what we do today, but a lot better. And a lot of what we did during the pandemic was figure out, okay, we've got to deliver instruction. How do we do that better? We're maybe not good at it. Sources added, et cetera, for schools that weren't in that space. Um, usually doing it better is great for the consumer. It usually adds cost. So if you have a broken underlying business model, like you do in so much of higher education, great that your quality just improved. You haven't solved for your business problem. Mm -hmm. Second bucket is um, doing the work you've, you've always done, but more efficiently or cost effective. So higher education has a, so in the first bucket, I think we have an amazing track record of higher ed. We don't get enough credit. When I was a president of a very small rural college in Vermont, I remember when we got our first live feed to the Hubble Space Telescope, and now students in this isolated rural community could get, we could do things in our astronomy class that were never possible for six months before. So we have a great story to tell. In terms of efficiency and cost savings, we don't. We're too egalitarian. We don't have the pressures of a for-profit world where every dollar translates into a multiple and EBITDA, et cetera, et cetera. So we tend to move people around and we get more efficient, but we're not great at it. Both of those innovations are what play with called sustaining innovation because they allow you to play the game the way you've always played it, but either better or in a more efficient way. The third bucket, the disruptive innovation, are those times when you're trying to actually change the rules of the game. Since the rules of the game, there are winners, there are losers, you often don't do it as well at first, so this is Clay's innovation improvement curve. Um, and he would say the place that you always want to try to do that first is with a population that's willing to put up with your kludginess in the beginning. So you're not as good as the incumbent thing because they don't have a great choice. So non-consumer, under-consumer populations. <laughs> so we brought competency-based programs into refugee camps. We could have brought any program we wanted because they were just desperate for education. Mm -hmm. and they were willing to put up with us as we got it right. And we were very diligent about making sure that when we got it wrong for them, we fixed it. <laughs> students always come first. But I think uh, that's how we think about the response to innovation part. So the work that's happening now, I just came from the ASU GSB Summit, which is a big ed tech summit down in San Diego. It's a crazy sort of must attend event if you're in that space. Um, I think, you know, if you were to take a look at the disruptive innovation talk today, it's in the non credential space. The idea that micro credentials, stackable non degrees could actually have workforce currency and might actually even be better for lots of learners who don't have the privilege of two or four years. Um, so that's one of the big ones. Another would be the use of uh, machine learning and data. Um, we could go deep on that, but those are examples of the kind of thing we're seeing now. Yeah, let me bring up the case. I remember when I sat in on the webinar, and this was like a year and a half ago, and this is early days when we were using Zoom in a classroom setting, and you had a lot of faculty from all over the country, and there was kind of the normal grousing you would expect about the Zoom experience. And people were saying on the thing, you know what, it, technology will never, you know, be able to create a good learning experience. And I remember you said, think about a benchmark. I'm going to put out a benchmark here for you to think about where we could get in the future. And you talk about online gaming. And you basically said in online gaming, you're creating a one-to-one -one experience. It's highly customized. You're reacting to what somebody else is doing. You have the option of place that so you don't have to be in a physical place. And it's low cost. Is that a long-term vision for higher education? Yeah, so I have the gamers in the room. So when I watch my nephews, some nieces, who are gamers, I, I watch this, um, for me, almost I, ideal learning experience, however, which the game puts them in an environment that they have to sort through, they have to understand. I really love intelligent games that change the environment around the player as you go. They adjust the difficulty. They give you hints if you need them. If you are multiplayer games, you actually do get community. If you're on Twitch, you actually have people who are watching and engaging you, right, in those ways. And when you watch the breakthrough, so what happens? Time falls away. You look up, say, oh, my God, three hours have gone by. Um, when you have that breakthrough, the endorphin rush, the space is like, oh, got it, right? What if learning could look like that? <laughs> right? What if learning had that sort of a so I'm really interested in games uh, in that respect. I'm also in, interested in games in terms of general engagement. Uh -huh. um, 
Yeah, and so would that eventually be what they'd call big bang disruption? So high feature, low cost. And that's when they just turn everything upside down in an industry. Yeah, I think so too, and it has other benefits, Terry. So another is, if you believe in competencies as a new exchange rate, another way of measuring learning instead of credit hour, I mean, hard script of the credit hour, um, competencies ask you to demonstrate what you can do with what you've learned. That immediately puts you into performative assessment. Games are performance-based assessment. So I think games, if you think about less, a little less about games, more about simulations, immersive environments, places where you have to do something repetitive. I'll give you just a quick example. Uh, we work at Boston Children's Hospital. New nurses in the, uh, at the Children's Hospital in emergency room situations, one of the most dangerous moments, and they make mistakes all the time when they're new, is in getting medical dosages right for infants and emergencies. So if you and I have a slightly different dosage, no big deal. The difference between a two-month-old and a six-month-old could be the difference between life and death. So our game design students created a simulation of an emergency room, a children's emergency room, bells going off, pressure clock, people barking things at you. And then they had a syringe, a physical syringe connected to sensors. And they, uh, BCH put nurses, new nurses, through this again and again. The nurses loved it. And they, were, they talked about the uh, decrease in the number of so they had, it was just pretty amazing what happened that's an easy example of that kind of immersive learning yep. where you perform a duty based on your knowledge but you perform and demonstrate mastery or something so tell me if you were to go out 10 20 years from now and say how does this movie play out um higher education higher education institutions and let's leave ucla out and all the other great schools we're filled with so we don't create a polarized environment on this but if you were to take um uh private colleges liberal arts colleges that are very expensive that you'd say are not ranked especially high is the argument is that players like southern new hampshire university are going to start moving in and disrupting that market and you have a whole different provision of education that's lower cost and better quality at some point. So we have elements of it today, right? We can do, we can produce for students much, a greater variety of formats for their learning. I would argue that for our, many of our students, the kinds of immersive learning, uh, workplace learning, apprenticeship-based models have been incredibly successful. They feel relevant. They feel like it's learning that they could put to work the very next day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the work they want to do. And it's a pretty rich, you know, if you look at the research on high impact practices, mm -hmm. it's not many students who say, actually, my classroom was the most impactful thing that happened to me, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's everything from the, I had an amazing mentor who I worked in his or her lab, I worked in undergraduate <laughs> research, or I did an apprenticeship, or I did an internship, and it changed my I went abroad. You know, I, I think, you know, my wife and I, the thing we fund more than anything else is study abroad for Pell Grant students because the first time I went abroad I changed my life. Um, we love those experiences. Those are high impact practices. We can build learning models that build in many more high impact practices and I think also lower cost. Interesting. Okay. And so this is going to potentially change the future of higher education. Let me ask from a student standpoint, you always want to look at, you know, will adoption occur and how things play out. COVID feels like it's changed the idea of place in our lives, where we shop, where we're entertained, where we go to school, et cetera. Has COVID in essence accelerated the interest in online education and remote education? For sure. I mean, there was a lot of bad remote learning that happened yeah. right, for people who weren't prepared uh, or, you know, just we were thrown into this unprepared. Uh, so there was that very mixed experience. But I do think that a couple of things happened. So one is, we got a very uh, visceral reminder of how important place and community is for residential institutions. So those places that chose to shut down, as my campus did, I think it was probably a mistake. We shouldn't have shut down the first day. We should have worked it through. I don't. I, this is not meant to be controversial. But I think we're going to. I think there's a persuasive argument. Will that the shutting down of public schools is probably in retrospect perhaps a mistake. We didn't know at the time. So people were trying to be safe, but, but we, you know, we exacted a very high toll for that. And I think one of, part of what we know is the job to be done in residential campuses is I want my learning, I need my academic experience, but I really thrive the relationship and community that comes with the That's what's true for all learners, but it's true for a lot of learners. And I think that was very, very uh, vividly illustrated. So, so there's that piece. However, I do think the watchword will be fluidity in the future. Um, I watch my own daughters talk about being in lecture halls of 300 students, but 25% of the students are in because you don't really have to show up at the lecture hall. You can get the notes, you can watch it later on. 
recorded form. So that fluidity of, hey, today I want to be in the class. Tomorrow I'm busy. Uh, I want to do it later asynchronously. Mm -hmm. um, I don't feel like driving across the town, uh, the city today. New England, it's a snowstorm. I'm going to stay home and take the class. So I think we are going to watch where it will be the kind of fluidity of experience for students. Yep. Excellent. Let me ask you about other sectors now, because when we had our conversation, that conversation rapidly moved past education. Mm -hmm. And you were talking about a bunch of social institutions, public institutions that were not serving their mission well, and maybe there were some learnings. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think when I was writing this book, which is about reforming the system of higher ed, the book that came out last fall, I had to get distracted and wrote, I know it's not, weird, it's not, it's not very good, but I wrote a whole nother book. I had to take a break from the first one because I was distracted by a question. The question that kept coming up was, why are the social systems that are meant to lift people up, why are those scaled social systems so often come to dehumanize the very people they're meant to serve. It happens all the time. I think it happens in K-12. I think it happens in a lot of post-secondary. It happens in healthcare. It happens in mental health. It happens in criminal justice. Doesn't even pretend anymore. In all of those cases, you want to look at this. <laughs> Maybe move it up higher. Is that better? That's not the one, by the way. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Oh. Um, oh. But in all of these social systems, um, we routinely dehumanize people. And you might ask, you know, does that happen in higher education? I'm sure it doesn't happen at UCLA. But when I take a look at um, the pressure we put on high school kids around college admissions and the mental health impact <clears throat> of that process on students' sense of self-worth, if you come to um, many institutions as a student of color, our first generation student, there are signals all the time that tell you you don't belong. And they're subtle in many cases, and they're not so subtle in other cases. I was really influenced by the work of Greg Elliott, who's a wonderful sociologist at Brown, who persuaded Brown to do a center for first generation students. Uh, because there are so many ways that he felt students weren't being well served by that very good university. Um, I think so, so, and if I look at higher ed, I can keep going, right? So I can look at um, the amount of debt that we impose upon students. I can look at the kind of structural racism that requires students to, especially students of color, to have to pursue graduate degrees. And even when they have those graduate degrees, they will, black men will earn less than their white counterparts with the very same degree. We could go on and on around that piece. So I think, um, you know, what I concluded is our question is, you know, can we conclude that higher education is an industry that loves its students? And I would say sort of a mixed bag. For a lot of students, the answer might actually be no. Um, so I, might, I set out to start interviewing people in other systems, healthcare heads, really interesting. Any of you who have navigated healthcare systems often felt dehumanizing. I interviewed Loris Barretts, who was the head of the University of Utah healthcare system. It was the, in the lowest performing 10% of healthcare systems in the country when he took over. And it was really interesting. He set out on a journey to make it better when his wife had a sudden attack of kidney stones. Very, very painful, apparently. I haven't had to suffer this. He brings her to the hospital, his hospital, one of his hospitals. And she has a terrible experience. And he was describing this and the way she was treated and doctors talking past her and no one sort of giving, you know, like, put on this paper, Johnny. There begins your, your dehumanization. It goes from there. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I stopped and I said, Loris, did they know who she was? Like, they, this is your spouse? And he goes, yes. So can you imagine if you're some poor schmuck off the streets? So he, he, he set out, he started thinking about this and felt ashamed. Like, does this happen to other people? And he went to the department that was a, uh, in charge of sort of quality assurance. This is all this guy in the book. And he realized, he, he discovered, they weren't sending the complaint letters to him. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, I need to see those stories. So he demanded those and he started looking at this and they started looking at the data and he started looking at their rankings. And he set out to improve the patient experience and rehumanize. And um, within five years, they were the number one ranked healthcare system in the country. And, and I interviewed all of these innovators in interesting spaces. And here's my conclusion around scaled systems. It begins with mattering. If you build a scaled organization or system in which people feel like they, they don't matter, you've lost the game right out of the gate. It's not enough, but that's the beginning point. And the second chapter in that book is about how do we lift people's hopes and aspirations? How do you lift their sights? 
Um, and, and, and it sort of moves from there all the way up to sort of systems and innovators who are doing interesting stuff. But I will tell you that in all of the systems where people are having markedly better results, where people feel like they're treated like human beings, it all starts and stays with relationship. And it's very hard to scale the messiness of human relations. So it forces us to think very differently about the way we build organizations and how we think about industries. So if we go back to higher education itself, um, in terms of um, the service delivery, maybe call it the teaching, oops, the teaching delivery uh, mission of higher education versus research, is the argument that research needs to continue as it is, it's creating breakthroughs, et cetera, but the service delivery part is the part that's going to have to change longer term. Yeah, so higher, if we go back to that phrase of jobs to be done, higher education is not asked to do one job. Higher education does multiple jobs, right? So it has a research function, which we don't fund well enough, and we need to do better and do more of, and it's critically important. We saw that during the pandemic. It has an economic uh, economic engine function. So, you know, when these small colleges, these small towns are about to go under, it's not just about what happens to those faculty. It's about how, what happens to that whole town, right? And, and, and the jobs and what that does in those communities. But the principal job for, in my mind, or the job that I care most about, let me rephrase that, is the job of creating economic opportunity, social mobility for students. And that job does have to change. That job's not working right now for too, too many people, as we talked about earlier. Great. Let me get into the next topic, which is on technology itself, because you've implicitly talked about the use of data and artificial intelligence. You've uh, indirectly talked about high speed mobile networks and fixed networks that allow online education. Tell us about the role of technology. And let me put the add on to it that we're living in an environment today that the tech lash issues are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Data privacy issues, automation that's going to get rid of jobs. Digital divide, people that don't have access to the internet, et cetera. The list goes on and on and on. How do you think about the wise use of technology without creating more unintended consequences, negative consequences? Um, it's obviously an enormous challenge because right now the technology is outpacing our society's ability to keep up it, keep up with it from a sociological, psychological, ethical, and policy perspective. Um, I just came from meeting with an Eisenhower fellow who used to work with a colleague of yours in the Obama White House, who's really trying to get grant funding to look at these questions. So, so I have no great insight into that question. I will tell you that as we look at the deployment of technology, it always comes back to us first with how does this do for students, right? And how does this protect or enable our address equity for students? We have a a sign in every single meeting room and conference room in our offices and on our campus. And the sign says, are the decisions we just made here good for our students? It's the way we end every meeting. Wow. And it's a, it's a bracing reality check for us um, when you ask that question around technology. So I'll give you an example. We use, and we're, we're data-driven. Um, our whole online model rests on relationships. So every student gets a coach, an academic advisor, but really they're life coaches for our students. Um, you know, if you're an online learner, and again, you have a couple of kids, you're working a full-time job, you're often a student at nine o'clock at night. It can feel pretty isolating and lonely. Your family's in the next room watching their favorite sitcom. You're at the dining room table trying to you know, get through stats, get a textbook <laughs> in front of you. Um, and it's easy for, our, you know, our learners are the 45% of Americans who say that, they would struggle to come up with 400 bucks for an unexpected car repair. Their social capital is that thin. It's very easy. They're fragile learners. It matters a lot that there is an academic advisor who believes in them, who's checking on them, who, who is cajoling, who's encouraging. They have, intimate, they have an intimate relationship. They're in relationship. I'm going to come back to that word. So tens of thousands of people fly to Manchester, New Hampshire for graduation. It's coming up in another month or so. Um, and the most emotional moments are the reunions of students with their advisors who have known each other in some cases for years because our students chip away at their degrees slowly. And then they meet each other for the first time. And it's amazing. And they're often meeting each other with, you know, a kid in an arm, right? Like these are families. This is a, this is a, a, a big deal. So I think the point I want to make to go back to your question, our advisors are enabled by a data-rich CRM. Mm -hmm. They often know how those students are performing before the student knows how they're performing. Right? We know we do predictive analytics on every student. We know when someone is underperforming. And that phone call is proactive. We don't wait for someone to say, I need to talk to my advisor. 
So if I'm, when I log in as an advisor, I get a set of my cases, students in my caseload, um, and there's Terry. Mm -hmm. And Terry just had an exam back. He didn't perform very well. And I'm making that. I'm going to reach out to you. Hey, Terry, can we just jump on the call? I'm usually text messaging because no one picks up a phone anymore. So eventually I get you on the line. Yes. I say, Terry, how, what, how, what's going on? It looked like you struggled a little bit with that stats exam. And Terry might say, oh, week from hell. The kid's sick. Work's been terrible. I'm back on the game next week. Don't worry about it. I, I'm going to get caught up. I'm going to go back and see if I can get some extra credit. Or you might say, you know what? I don't know if I should do this. What was I thinking signing up for college? And then in that moment, that's the critical intervention moment. And we're looking really hard at how we use data to enable richer human interactions. Yeah. It goes back to that. Are you using data to help students? Are you doing, using data in some other form? That's a customized model that is lower cost. It is lower cost. Customized in a big classroom setting and big institution and lower cost. Yeah, and I, like I'll use one example, and I mentioned, so I interviewed the CEO of this really innovative opioid treatment um, company. It's a for-profit entity. It's, their results are two to three times better than the industry average. So I, like, I said, walk me through, what are you doing? What are you doing differently about this? So in most uh, substance abuse treatment, uh, insurance companies pay for expensive things. They'll, they'll pay for me if I am the sort of medical staff person to have Terry tested every day. And you know what? My organization makes more money if I test Terry every day. It may not be good for Terry. In fact, it's kind of humiliating. Yeah. Right? But the economic model, what gets paid for, where the incentives sit, where the disincentives sit, start to drive human behaviors and organizational behaviors. They went back and they said, look at medical staff, testing, all of this clinical stuff is really expensive. You're the insurance company. You want to drive down those costs. Pay for the thing that you don't like to pay for. What was that? More counseling sessions. Why? Because counselors actually know the story of the people sitting in front of them. They construct those, those groups, and I could unpack that differently. And what they've done is they have deeply reduced the use of the medical staff, deeply reduced the clinical <clears throat> interventions. They don't let the medical staff quarterback the care any longer. The medical staff didn't even know the people. They're often working on paper. Mm -hmm. And they let the counselor drive the, the, the treatment plan. And their results, as I said, two to three times better. Um, and it's working beautifully. And they're, they're growing like crazy. What's that work there? Human relationship. Someone who knows you and knows your multiple stories, helping you lift your life up, right? So yep. lots of examples of that. Let me ask you a couple last questions related to leadership. And then when I take the questions, we've got a lot of questions that have come in from the audience. So the first one is, is the role of leaders in getting this mission that you've talked about adopted? How do you think about the constituents that are in this environment, um, instructors, uh, public officials, et cetera, that are necessary for the broader mission to be uh, advanced? I'm not sure I'm track, quite tracking your question. What do you, do about you, want, you have a, a model for, for online education and higher education. And if you want penetration rate to get to 50% in the nation, let's assume it's mm -hmm. a one or 2%. How do you get to 50%? Because you're going to need to convert a lot of established uh, constituents and institutions and all that to a different model. How do you get that adoption happening? Yeah. So I think you have to, if I could channel our friend Clay, yeah. he would say the classic disruptive play is to start doing new models, create new models for underserved populations, get it right, keep improving it. And what you will see is the disruption of the incumbent industry and the incumbent practices over time because people will, will make those choices. Mm -hmm. The problem that I think one of the things, and Clay and I would talk about this quite often, that model works in kind of a pure market setting. And by the way, we don't have a lot of pure markets, as you know. <laughs> um, but we are in a regu regulated industry in higher education. So um, it's a, it, change comes much more slowly. We're like healthcare in that respect. So the argument I have made for policymakers is that both in terms of federal regulation, state regulation, and accreditors, we have to be comfortable, and in universities, making safe spaces for experiments mm -hmm. um, and to do it with populations we don't usually serve. Mm -hmm. That's sort of the way we get there, I think. And yep. then we have to make some foundational changes. So in the book, I argue a lot against the inequities of the credit hour and, and the fact that it was never designed to do to be used the way we use it. It's a lousy measure of learning. It tells really good at telling you how long someone sat. It doesn't actually tell you very much about what they know and what they can do. And that if we could move to um, competency-based models uh, as a basis for looking at learning, but more importantly, 
as a basis for dispersing $156 billion of federal financial aid every year, that changes the system. Yep. That's a foundational change that starts to move the system. It's going to be really hard because if you ask faculty to do what competency-based models ask you, which is be crystal clear about the claims you make for learning and give us rigorous assessment, you know what? A whole lot of students are going to start struggling because it's, going to, it's harder. Yep. And faculty, let me rephrase this, a lot of higher ed is not good at assessment. It's, not, it's, it's the science of assessment, the practice of assessment. When I was at the U.S. Department of Ed as a senior policy advisor, uh, I said to Ted Mitchell, a friend of Tina and I have, uh, who was the undersecretary at the time, said, can I do a primer on assessment for the department? Because no one here seems to know very much about it. And we brought in AIR, right? Bring in someone who's expert, not me. And we brought them in. And, and you know, their conclusion, not their words, my words, is the state of assessment in most of higher ed is somewhere between dismal and awful. Um, and, and we can unpack that for a while, right? So I, I, think it's, I think to make this move is going to be really hard. Yeah. And we might have to live with the fact that graduation rates will go down for a while. Because if you're actually not going to let somebody slide by with a C, right? If you're going to actually demand mastery, demonstrated mastery through performance-based assessments, that's a pretty high bar. It's the bar we use now, but only mostly where our life depends on it. So it's great that you have a 4.0 from Emory Riddle and the aviation program, not letting you get in the front of the plane yet. You're going to take FAA exams, but more importantly, going back to performance, we're putting you in a simulator for a lot of hours, and then we're going to put you in the right-hand seat for a lot of hours under the watchful eye of someone who actually knows what performance looks like to sign off that you can do the thing you're supposed to be able to do. Yep. We do this in nursing. We do this in medical school. We do it in lots of places where we know we're not trusting grades because we don't Trades don't actually work very well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I, but, the, but that's a high bar if you think about those professions and what's required in those days. Let me take you as a thing. You don't want your pilot to be good at everything but landing. Turns out that's really important. <laughs> <laughs> you want your surgeon like, hey, he's really good, just doesn't close very well, and someone should do something out here. So. I'd rather be in an autonomous aircraft, I think, <laughs> than a pilot one. Um, so let me ask you a bunch of the questions. We've got a huge yeah. number, and they've been upvoted by huge numbers. So Pranav had 24 upvoted on question, talent is everywhere, but opportunity is not. How will online education allow international students to break through tightly capped enrollment at top tier colleges? So we can unpack the question of top tier colleges for a while. Okay. <laughs> top tier colleges are, with some exceptions, you said it's a top tier college, which has a mandate um, to, again, serve many, but admission acceptance rates are 10%. Eight, nine, ten percent. Yeah. Yeah. Your acceptance rates are the acceptance rates of uh, Harvard now. Um, and elite colleges uh, often build their reputation status on exclusivity. So rejection-based colleges, which is most of elite higher ed, has an ontological problem. They have a sort of, they, they're not built to accept more students, but in fact, they could. There's enormous talent out there. I remember when Larry Baca was a friend, president of Harvard, uh, Larry's got a great story. His mother was a Holocaust survivor. His father fled pogroms in Eastern Europe in the 1930s. Larry grew up in Michigan, um, wasn't wealthy, um, and is a remarkable human being. Um, and when he was appointed at Harvard, he said, I understand how Harvard is relevant to the elites of the West Coast and the elites of the East Coast. I just don't know if it's still relevant to a poor kid from Michigan. Wow. Right. His story. And I think what's happened in a lot of our elite schools, I'm going to go back to your, your, your uh, question for a moment. So sorry for the harangue here. But I think what's happening is that, you know, they've always been elite, but now when they're considered elitist, I think they become part of the problem and not part of the solution. And in the higher ed that I love that changed my life was part of the solution. And for, I sit on the American Council of Education board um, and every year we commission Gallup to do a poll of attitudes of Americans, generally speaking, those are broad swaths of Americans. The standing of higher ed in, a, in the United States is plummeting. People are angry about it. Um, they don't make much of a distinction between publics and privates, not-for-profit or for-profit. They all think they're being gouged. <laughs> the Varsity Blues scandal only confirmed what they suspected. See, the game was rigged. I always knew the game was rigged. You have money, it works for you. Right. And, and it breaks my heart because it is a great industry that does transform lives, but it's leaving too many people behind. For international students who wish to come, 
Um, I don't think we're going to solve it for the elite and selective institutions. Distance education is not going to do anything about that. But it will allow us to reach people with high quality education in much higher numbers. And increasingly, if you go back to the idea of fluidity, the idea of the sort of, no, I have to go to America for all four years, probably not the case. Um, so hybrid programs, programs a lot of people do online and in place, whole mixes of that, I think, mm -hmm. are going to be critical. We just invested in a really interesting university. It's for-profit. It's called Nexford University, N-E-X-F-O-R-D, licensed in the U.S., based in London, um, building subscription models, one to $200 a month, <laughs> focusing on developing economies where those students are not coming to the U.S., they're not going to Europe, um, but they need education. And, of course, Africa is the future. I mean, it's the youngest continent in the world that's exploding. Um, it's an amazing place, right? And they're trying to move in and say, what can that look like? And it's interesting because it was built by technologists, not educators. And you might say, well, that's a bad idea. You know, why don't we have educators? But they are not bound by the way we think of the questions. We can address the educational questions for them. But it's really fascinating to watch how they're building mm -hmm. this institution. Yeah. So they would, for example, say your um, high paid U.S. based faculty are really expensive in the world that we're trying to serve. So they are scaffolding academic support. So they use data and they say, hey, Terry's starting to struggle with this assignment. It's taking longer than usual. Let's shoot him some content. We know, we know, we've done the data. We know where 80% of the students get stuck. So we're going to give him content. No one's doing it. It's automated. It's yep. machine-based. Um, Terry's still stuck. Doesn't seem to be breaking through. Let's use a chatbot. Because again, we kind of, we've studied. We know where most of those things are. Terry would never struggle this way, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> doesn't sort of break through okay, I think he needs to talk to somebody. Are he signals I want to talk to somebody? They're using, they're leveraging their academics in the Philippines who have perfect English skills and who are trained and they're paying at rates higher than academics who train the Philippines and getting that. You're still stuck. You yeah. still can't break through. Now you're going to talk to an American academic. Yeah. But what they're doing is they're using just the right level of in intervention yeah. and saving the most expensive human beings for when those matter most. Yeah. Paul, I'm trying to get the narrative of how the change occurs here. Let me take a shot at it. I just spoke yesterday to the head of Amazon Care, their, their healthcare business. And it was a very interesting conversation because he said they're focusing very much on the customer, not the healthcare provider, not the insurance company, the patient experience. It's basically a fair conclusion here is what you're describing over the last 45 minutes is an outsider in um, revolution of education. This is not enabling existing institutions to change what they're doing. You're talking about a whole different model that's going to require different institutions, different players to change how things are done. And the ecosystem is changing that way now. So Grow with Google, for example, is now training thousands and thousands and thousands of people and their micro-credentials. They have over 200 employers who say, we will take these into account and accept them as we look at hiring. You've got a job market now where 10 million jobs are unfilled. So the degree is not going to be required the way it was when we had high levels of employment, right? So, um, and you know, if I were channeling Byron, Byron Goose, I'm sure I know for workforce in the White House, the Obama administration, he would say, look at the requirement of a bachelor's degree is a deeply inequitable thing that keeps a lot of people of color out of the job market when you sign up to jobs that don't require college degrees. Um, and I think more importantly, the sort of 4 and 40 model is pretty gone. So the 4 and 40 model is four years of university and 40 years of career. And we know you are going to, all of you will be dipping in and out of a learning ecosystem all of the rest of your lives because the half life of your skills is three years now. So even when your job does not change, your job will change out from under you and you're going to have to go back in. And we have to build a learning ecosystem, a post-secondary ecosystem that can give you, and we use this phrase all the time, just the right amount of learning in just the right way at just the right time. And that could be two days. That could be, hey, I'm, I'm a programmer. I'm working in Python. There's a new subroutine. My job requires me to master it. I just need a day. Like, give me that subroutine. It could be two days. It could be two weeks. It could be two months. It could be two years. Degrees won't go away. But I think what we will see in the new learning ecosystem is a greater granularity of degrees. And now, to your point, Terry, a whole lot of new pro providers. So we give credit for Salesforce Trailhead credentials. Uh, Grow with Google is another example. IBM, it started in tech, but it's moving into healthcare now. Healthcare is an industry in crisis in terms of being able to fill jobs. Education is another one. So I just uh, met with a wonderful entrepreneur this morning 
who is focusing on the teacher crisis in rural America. What they're trying to do is take paraprofessionals through an apprenticeship program, not using Title IV money. So remember, where the money comes from and how the money flows actually has a huge influence on your system design. Mm -hmm. They're using WAO money, so Labor Department money, and they're putting people in apprenticeships so that they get credit as paraprofessionals. This is really interesting, Tina. And then the system sort of captures that data, cross-locks it to the standard courses, I'm sorry, I get wonky on this really quick. But the bottom line of this is they're really thinking about new source of money, new kind of provider that isn't a university. Um, they partner, right? They have to partner for certification. Um, and then how we train paraprofessionals in the real world, supplemented with some online courses and move them up into higher paying teaching jobs. And the difference is they're not leaving those communities. They're not the teacher who comes in and works in a rural, poor, low-income school for five years. They live in that community. Their families are in that community, uh, and they stay. I think it's a really powerful, powerful idea. Yep. Another, uh, another question um, here. Uh, Arizona State built a new campus in L.A. for thousands of students rejected by California State uh, universities and UCs. Um, versus online. Is this like Amazon seeing benefits of physical storefronts? <laughs> oh, Amazon's closing the physical storefronts. Yes, <laughs> 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 so not clear, yeah. but, but remember, don't be too quick to say that's a failure. I'm very <laughs> fond of the Institute for the Future out of Palo Alto. And they talk about uh, artifacts from the future. Things that we try today that fail in the moment, but actually signal when you can recognize them <laughs> And I do think hybrid is going to be critical. So if you, I know you, you, it won't be a problem for you. You've signed off for four years. It won't happen that quick at UCLA, I'm pretty sure. But I can make an argument that UCLA should not have any student here for more than 50% of their time. Double the capacity overnight. It's more complicated than that. It's more complicated. But yeah. you can start to see how you start thinking about that. When Kim Clark went from HBS to BYU, uh, Idaho, he said, why do we still have a summer agrarian catalog? I'm going to do three terms because the demand signal is so high and I can't serve enough students. And you get to choose two, but you can't be here for three. You can choose two of the semesters. Mm -hmm. um, and he added a third of his capacity, right? Now, again, there are more faculty need to be hired, et cetera, et cetera. It's very complex. But I think those are the kinds of things we can start to do. Yep. Um, and whether Arizona State's campus is the right model, the right thing, but, but I do think it's a nod to that sort of hybrid, hybrid sort of form of education in the future. Good. Let me ask you a last question, then we'll do a uh, uh, wrap up here. Um, one of the students mentioned in our classes, we talk about hyper specializations um, in online education. Will you have the ability for students to cover a wider range of topics much deeper? Is there kind of a unique kind of academic experience that people will now be able to have that they couldn't have before? I don't know that they couldn't have it before or that it's particularly enabled by online. And online does give you reach into places that you can't get to geographically. So we were talking about during the pandemic, all of a sudden you can start pulling together new programs. So there's a governance question. There's a curricular design question. There are whole lots of questions to go into that, unpack that. But I'll tell you, if you talk to the folks who are doing kind of human development at IBM, they talk about T-shaped employees. So they know that they need people who are very, very deep in a particular area, but very broad in terms of what, I prefer to call it kind of enduring skills or power skills, lots of names. They're not soft skills. They're the hardest things in the world to teach. But, you know, so that's the ability, you know, what traits that we often associate with the humanities, critical thinking, communication, navigating others, that culture. And if you're in the camp, as I am, that thinks we will see enormous job displacement through automation, mm -hmm. I do think we will see that. And I do think there are lots of high paying jobs. So white collar jobs will go away. I think accounting, for example, will have 10% of the accountants we use today uh, in the future. Um, I don't know how far in the future that is. So what will be the jobs that algorithms won't replace? I would argue, I argue it in, in, in the book, in the new book, um, that these are distinctly human jobs and that it's going to require a radical rethinking of what we're willing to pay for and what we value in the culture. So I think a lot of what a lot of technology jobs will go away because those, that's already happening, algorithmically driven programming, et cetera, et cetera. But we, we, we don't lack for enough jobs. We just don't want to pay for them. We should be flooding our mental health care system. We don't have a mental health care system. It's called prison. 
We could be flooding our mental health care system in America with people who can do great work. We should be flooding our, our, our underserved communities with social workers. We should be flooding our schools with early, and we should have Head Start and preschool for everybody. We could flood, right? But you can't afford to be a pre, an elementary school teacher, or at least an early ed teacher in the United States. Yep, right. So we have to think about where the jobs will be, what the jobs, where the jobs impact most, and I would argue that there are just lots and lots of people who would love to do that work if they could be paid a fair salary to do it. Mm-hmm. So Jimmy Marisotis, who's the head of the Lumina Foundation, uh, and I are not fans of universal basic income, but we, uh, we argue for universal human work. What we would argue is that if your job's is placed, you get a guaranteed $45,000 salary to work in these sectors and, and would join Bill Gates, tax the robots. <laughs> Wow, fascinating, fascinating. Paul, let me do a wrap up here. I always like to share my so what's or my takeaways and give you a chance to upgrade them or share any uh, share any parting comments you've got. So several kind of takeaways I got. Number one, thinking about, I won't use the term customer, students, and looking about how many of them are not being served altogether or poorly served. And you talked about some of the outcomes about debt that people have got and people have uh, failed to finish degrees, et cetera, et cetera. Second comment or takeaway is fundamentally our premises about students and society. And you talked about don't create these single stories about people, labeling, boxing, you're this, you're not that, et cetera, to kind of cordon them in in terms of their opportunities, education, um, et cetera. Third point is about the role of technology. And the role of technology actually is fairly profound because you talked a lot about the role of data. You talked about the role of CRM. You highlighted online gaming as a long-term kind of vision about the way that things could be that's interesting. You also talked about other sectors that have a similar story, healthcare and others that um, are very much applicable. A um, couple other points. You talked about from a leadership standpoint, remember our institutions are not viewed in most cases very positively. And all institutions, businesses, government, academic institutions, et cetera. And being elite in what we do shouldn't translate to being elitist because that's part of what kind of fuels a lot of the cynicism about the, uh, the institution. A couple last points, the shelf life of learning. You know, we kind of think about these discrete kind of learning experiences in their four years or their two years of graduate school, et cetera. And your view is it's going to extend significantly. And the ability to just kind of do something one off is not going to be uh, another. Um, and then the final point that, uh, that you raised is that uh, there's a lot of problem. And I, I kind of, as I listened to you, partly felt like this is very discouraging, the whole situation. This is a humanitarian crisis. But I also felt like you said, you know what, there's a lot of things that can happen. This may be an outside in transformation, but it will happen and don't despair. Yeah. And on that last point, it's really important. I'm actually an optimist about what's going on. I'm pretty excited about what I'm seeing. The exercise of writing that book and talking to these incredible entrepreneurs and also talking to sociologists and psychologists and talking about where we are today was actually really encouraging and maybe it reassured me because I see so many smart people who are thinking about the system differently and starting to, to move through this. I do sometimes wonder if we have to be this broken to fix it because we're really broken right now. We're broken in the country, I think, in some ways. And I don't know why I'm smiling when I say that. that's going to be <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I think we're really broken, but I think sometimes you have to be broken to shake through, right? And and sometimes, um, as in, in in our individual lives, you kind of have to get knocked on your ass to sort of get up, and that's where your best learning happens. Yeah. And I think we're looking around, and I just know, look at in all of these industries where I think we are dehumanizing people and not lifting people up that feel broken to be the title of this book. Most of the people in those industries have a calling to do good work. They don't want to do this work in that way. If you ask what, you know, what was the first thing Loris Barretts did when he wanted to make his medical staff more responsive and change the way they treated people and lift that system up? He paid a high-end production crew to take the worst of those letters and go find those people and interview them. And then he brought his medical staff into a large auditorium like this. And he, and he had them, without saying what he was doing, and he showed, and he showed them the videos. And he said it still makes people cry when they think about it. He was getting teary when he talked about it. And no one who's a doctor or nurse wanted anyone to feel that way under their care. No one. It's the, it's the exception. 
And, and when you start to reconnect people to the very human questions, then I think you start to get people who want to say, no, I'm going to put my hand up and try something different. Yeah. And, and I think that's happening all over the place. But I would love to see us now. Uh, my, my fondest goal, and I wish I were 25 years younger in my career, but you education let's do this, um, would be to think about how we now shift the monopoly of what counts for learning, how learning takes place over to students. Mm-hmm. So one of the things we're doing is we're working with refugee-led organizations to kind of decolonize our refugee program. To be able to say, look at, we'll give you all the ingredients, we'll give you guidance, we'll give you handholding, but own your learning, have agency in your learning. And I do think that's one of the interesting shifts that's starting to happen. Yeah. And I actually think it's a great one. So I'm a bit of a David Graeber fan. I, yeah. and this is part of it. Right? So it's a little bit of an anarchist education and the monopoly argument. I don't know how it looks, but it'd be really, really fun to sort that one out. I love it. So listen, let me do a couple of thank yous before we uh, we call it a wrap. I want to start. I just want to thank Tony and Tina because, you know, they to me, I don't think I've ever been more proud of UCLA, their encouragement of this discussion, which is all about leadership. It's all about society. It's all about how do you really make a difference? So I just want to thank them for, for encouraging this to happen. I want to thank all of you, the number of questions and the engagement on this. This is fundamentally a leadership issue. I want to thank the Easton Center team for doing all of this work. And then, Paul, I just want to thank you because I I am proud about what you're doing and the impact that you're making just intrinsically. But I'm also just very appreciative of the learnings because what you talk about isn't just education. It's much broader than that. And I think, you know, as a school here where we're trying to educate the next generation of leaders, that you've given us a lot of lateral models that can apply in a lot of places. So a big thank you. We hope your travels back to the East Coast are great. Um, We're going to have a reception in Briskin Plaza. And remember, Impact Week is April 18th. It's going to be about the future of L.A. and a lot of it about the institutions in L.A., how to make L.A. a better place, which I think you'll find very relevant from tonight's conversation. Thank you, guys. And we'll see you next time.